together and hang out. Okay, so we are live now. If anybody is joining us live right now, we're going to hang out for a few minutes and uh, see if anybody trickles in. So we'll, we'll get started here in, uh, in a few minutes. And uh, feel free to, if you have any questions for Abby from the Katie McGrath Book Club, or if you have any Supergirl Radio questions, feel free to drop those in the comment section and we will address them on the live stream. And uh, if uh, if you're joining us uh, from uh, some fun places, let us know uh, where you're, <laughs> you're joining us from because it's, it's always fun to see where people are listening and watching from. Looks like I've got Ashley and new Rachel. So hello, welcome. They're on YouTube. Lots lots of people on YouTube. Nice. Seems uh seems like YouTube is uh, the popular platform at the moment. <laughs> no one on Facebook. Come on, Facebook people. I believe in you. I don't know, Morgan. Do you prefer Facebook or YouTube? Probably Which YouTube, one? honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I probably would like it on Facebook. Uh, no, Facebook. What was I saying? YouTube. Although I feel like on Facebook, I might scroll past and it might just like be happening, and I'm like, oh, hey. Yeah, that's true. You could, uh, you could uh, notice it a little bit better on Facebook. But I like YouTube because you can have the different uh, viewing options. You can do the theater mode, or you can. That's do the true. Screen. You can get uh, really, you can get really fancy on YouTube. <laughs> I always oh, use like, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, YouTube is uh, pretty nice. Looks like uh, we've got some viewers from uh, Chile, I guess. Nice. Is that the correct pronunciation? I'm, I'm sorry if I butchered it. Um, yeah, so me, Rachel says uh, YouTube is easier. Yeah, that's uh, maybe true, but uh, we'll see. We got some Facebook folks. Oh, we got uh, somebody from Peru as well. So welcome. Nice. Welcome. All right. Well, we've got some uh, folks uh, kind of streaming in. So I guess uh, if it's okay, Morgan and Abby, uh, should we go ahead and get started? Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, we are going to uh, open up with our little uh, fancy little uh, live, uh, live stream intro. So enjoy the video and uh, we will be right back as soon as I can find it in my control. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Benoist and you're listening to Supergirl Radio. DC TV podcast. There's too many now. Exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> Is being, becoming a human burrito a plus or a minus? I don't know. It does seem snug. I mean, they say you are what you eat. Oh, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> so I do a podcast called Supergirl Radio, and one of our segments is Lena Luther boardroom or ballroom. Because really? the outfit, she looks like a boss in this coat. Nasty Luther, like a different Luther. It's not just Lena being mean. No. <laughs> Ooh. Helen Slater here. So fun to know that you're hosting a podcast called Supergirl Radio. Welcome to Supergirl Radio, your source for all things related to the CW Supergirl TV series and the character of Kara zor -El. My name is Rebecca Johnson. I'm Morgan Glennon. And for this episode of the podcast, we are live and wired with Abby of the Katie McGrath Book Club to hold our own book club to discuss Going on Being Buddhism in the Way of Change by Mark Epstein, who is in no relation to Jeffrey Epstein, in case you were curious. <laughs> Uh, so we wanted to put that out up front uh, just because uh, we were uh, curious about that. And so we just wanted to let everyone else know. Uh, so uh, welcome to Supergirl Radio, Abby. I, you are one of our listeners. So it's very exciting to actually get to interact with you and talk to you. So thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here. Well, that's awesome. We're we're really excited to talk to to you about the book club and everything you're doing with the you know the Supergirl fandom essentially. So, uh, but before we get into discussing the book club and the book that we are talking about uh, for this live stream, which is this book right here, uh, we need to get some uh, uh, some background information on you because one of the things that we always ask our first time guests on Supergirl Radio is how they met the character of Supergirl. So do you remember the first time you ever saw or heard of the character? I do. It was actually in Smallville. That was my uh, first introduction to anything super. Um, it was when I was in and um, my 
friend, I was over a friend's house and I didn't have a lot of TV growing up. And so she's like, let's watch Smallville. It's a great show, you're gonna love it. And I saw it and I was instantly hooked. And then uh, then Supergirl was introduced and it was from there. Um, and then going on to the TV show, my younger brother, he knew my obsession with Smallville. He's like, you have to watch the Supergirl show. It's now on Netflix, <laughs> just go. I just binged it myself. And when you have your teenage brother telling you to watch something, it's a rare moment and you got to do it. <laughs> um, so I did. I uh, binged it all and it ended up being uh, around where season two was coming out. So then I started following uh, season two. And then from there, it just kind of went on. <laughs> that's a that's a good introduction into the character, the Laura Vandervoort version, uh, where we're big mm -hmm. fans of her as well as her hand acting. As phenomenal. In acting. <laughs> phenomenal hand <laughs> acting. Uh, so a great Supergirl, uh, and even better Indigo, uh, <laughs> what we we like to say. Um, so so we, you've met Supergirl, you've met uh, the character of Kara, but uh, where did you first see uh, Katie McGrath? Because you've started the Katie Ma McGrath Book Club. So what was your first uh, thing that you saw of her? It, it was on Supergirl. So I was oh, watching okay. season two, and that first episode, she walks into her office, and I'm like, Oh, who's, who's that? <laughs> so then I do as any person would do nowadays. I go on to social media. I go on the Twitter. I go on to Instagram. I'm looking. I don't find anything. <laughs> you're looking. You're like, where is she? Is she? Yeah, I'm like, what? I'm like, what is this? Is it, is it like a different name? Like, what? Who is this person? And it, that gave me the uh, allure of her. And the, the mystery, from, if you will. The mystery, exactly. Yeah, a whole different part of like a person of a celebrity where they're not on um, social media. In fact, they're reading books. Mm. <laughs> and you would see pictures of her like in Merlin on the Supergirl set, always with a giant book in her hand. And I was like, I wonder what book that is. And so, you know, I kind of tried to zoom in a little bit, <laughs> try and figure it out. <laughs> um, and then on Twitter and other sites, there were different people had different ideas and different thoughts. And so I started doing a list of it. And then as I became more a bigger fan of her by watching Merlin, by watching the throwaways, one of our movies, uh, the Christmas movie, um, then there's Leading Lady, all these different ones. I started slowly, slowly. Like, Wait, she of... has a Christmas movie? This is very important to me personally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's um, a, pr a princess in Chris, no. It's not... It's a, like, I mean, princess you're putting Christmas together like, like every every possible Christmas title <laughs> in one mm -hmm. a Christmas princess smart. in Christmas Town. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very great. good wardrobe, by the way. Amazing. Lots of well, I'm, I'm looking that well, up for the nice holidays. <laughs> That's important information to know. Uh, thank you for that new information for mm -hmm. us. Uh, it looks like uh, a princess for Christmas. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were all close, weren't we? <laughs> uh, so we're going to have to definitely, uh, can we tie that to Supergirl somehow? I feel like we can. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I feel, I feel like we've tied weirder things. <laughs> we, we actually have cults, you know, so stuff like that. I'm sure we can do a, a Christmas uh Oh, uh, there's also something Christmas at uh, Castleberry Hall. Was that it? Yes. Um, that's uh, the same movie, but under a different name, I think, in the UK version. Oh, oh this this is a better that title. Fancy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's <laughs> like Downton Abbey vibes I'm getting from that one. <laughs> I like that title better. That's Me great. A, a Princess for Christmas. It's a little simple. It's not yeah. as, it's, it's fancy. Uh, well, that is um, that is great information to have. So, um, OK. And so how did you so you you just started the book club out of uh, wanting to know what what Katie was reading? Partially. Um, and then it was when she was in that New Zealand Comic Con and she had given a list of all these books uh, that she was reading. You can find the interview on Facebook. Um and so everyone on Twitter, because I finally found like Stan Twitter, I like had no <laughs> clue what that was before. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so I, everyone was tweeting about it and like what books there were and what other books she'd read. And I was like, well, I have a list. I've been slowly <laughs> collecting it. And um, so then I was talking to a person and we started chatting and we were joking about how we should start a book club. And I became really good friends with this person. And then a few months later, we actually started the book club. 
So it was just a random person. I had no clue, became really good friends with them. We both loved reading. We both uh, loved Katie and the show and her message. And we wanted to share that and be a positive uh, influence on the internet. Well, that's great. And I think it's so unique. And I think it does uh, serve a, a, a I guess a utilitarian purpose, like here's the list, go and read it. Uh, I think that's uh, something that uh, helps us because if we needed to go search for a book she was read, uh, you've already have it. You've already got yeah. it and ready to go. So thank you for that service that you're providing to all of us. Really appreciate it. Um, okay, so that's cool. And I, I guess um, one more question about the, uh, the book club before we get into the book that we're gonna discuss. Because I'm curious, uh, what is the most unusual thing on, on the list Ooh. that uh, you'd be surprised that Katie read? Is there something that sticks mm -hmm. out to you as something you wouldn't have expected? That's a really good question. Um, not something very like, weird or unsurprised, but so, um, one of my favorite books is The Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett. And so when I had found out that she read that uh, during the home con video, she was saying it's one of her favorite books. That was very like an exciting moment for me. I was very happy to hear that because that is one of my favorite books. And when you see a role model and someone having that kind of similar idea and thoughts, it's just a warming feeling. And it's, uh, I think a very positive influence as well. That's a cool connection. That's and awesome. uh, I, I remember that video, like she did talk about the book she had been reading during quarantine. That, that, was, a, that, that was the best. That was my favorite part of HomeCon. <laughs> it was the best part of HomeCon. Let's be honest. She's like, here are some podcast recommendations. And hold on. She grabs a stack of books. And she's <laughs> like, Here's what I've been doing. And I was like, uh, Katie's living my ideal life. <laughs> and then it's like 10 books. And then people uh, were like looking into the, the bookshelf in the back. I didn't figure out most of them. Other people did. I just want, like, I'll give full credit. Like, I did not do that. <laughs> Maybe I like people one or like, two. Zoom in and they're like, I'm pretty sure that this one is. <laughs> enhance, computer, enhance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> enhance. So that's great. Well, uh, mm -hmm. definitely uh, you can head over to, uh, where do I have it? Uh, KatieMcGrabBookClub.com. If you, you, you guys do have the list up there, yes? We do have, I don't know if it's updated though. Okay. Okay. So if you want to so see what, I, I what Katie, on that. yeah, if you want to see what Katie's been reading, uh, check it out and uh, um, maybe they'll give you some new, uh, new books to read. What's we been do your have favorite? a Google doc. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Nice. Not like What's Rebecca's, been... but it's growing. <laughs> How many pages is your Google doc? Is it 30? <laughs> <laughs> it's only a good Google Doc if it gets to at least 30. That's that's I mean, just I mean that's the rule. That's the rule here <laughs> at Supergirl Radio. <laughs> What's been your favorite book that you maybe wouldn't have read otherwise that you read because of the Katie McGraw book club? Um recently, uh I would say Three Women um by Lisa Tato. I, I don't know how to pronounce that. Um and it was actually a Katie and Ozzy recommendation. Um, and I've taught, I've talked to people about this with the book club or through the book club is it's about three women and I cannot, like, I personally can't relate to them, but by reading and going in th into their lives, you find this connection with them and you're constantly learning something and getting a different view and perspective of that. But if I was in, um, Barnes and Noble and I saw that and I mm -hmm. read inside, I, I don't think I would have bought it or picked it up. Um, so that was the most recent one um that and maybe the hobbit which was our august uh, book oh yeah of the month. I i've that. always had it on my shelf <laughs> yeah i always i've always had it on my shelf but i've never read it um so this was a good motivation to do it i am still reading it so i haven't finished it <laughs> but uh hopefully it's, it's a good book <laughs> Is The Hobbit easier to read than the uh, Lord of the Rings series? Because I read the prologue to Fellowship of the Ring and I was like, no, I'm not doing this. <laughs> and no. <laughs> it, was too, it, was too, it was too much for me. Uh, so I, I, was, I always wondered if The Hobbit would be easier to read, if that would be uh, a little bit on, more on my level because uh, uh, the, the other Lord of the Ring, Ring books were maybe a little too uh, high intelligence for me. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but that's cool. I, I'll have to, to check out the Hobbit cause I always wanted to try to read that one too. All right. Well, cool. Uh, let's get into some comments cause it looks like we have some regarding the club unseen squid frog says my introduction <laughs> to Ken uh, Follett maybe, 
uh, was through this club. So it looks like you're introducing people to uh, to new books and new authors, which is really neat. And uh, let's so cool. see. And uh, uh, I guess it's Ivana. If I've said that incorrectly, let me know. Uh, but apparently Katie recommended the BBC's uh, You're Dead to Me podcast. So, so I've mm -hmm. actually subscribed to it, but I have yet to listen to an episode. I was just like, she said it. I was like, cool, that sounds awesome. And then I just just never have the time. <laughs> uh, maybe, I've, maybe. No, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I would say I've listened to a couple episodes, but I've been mm -hmm. going back and forth with the Legends of Tomorrow. And I've started from season one, so I'm working my Whoa. way up. So I'm trying more. Really? <laughs> yeah. <Whoa. laughs> I am. That's that's impressive. Thank you. I, I I can't imagine what those early episodes are like. So Godspeed. <laughs> it's enjoyable. It's very enjoyable. <laughs> nice. Good. You, you, you can you can listen to them without having uh, watched the show. So <laughs> you can definitely uh, pop in there and listen to it. All right. Well, I guess uh, since we are having a book club here this week, I guess we could get into talking about this book, Going on Being, Buddhism in the Way of Change by uh, Mark Epstein. Uh, no relation to Jeffrey Epstein. We just want to reiterate that. Uh, OK, so um, uh, I guess what we could talk about is... Uh, the the book itself because I, I think we we do want to talk about the book and then talk about the book's relevance to Supergirl and uh, so I guess we could start with the book first so uh, Abby what do you what was your what was your either biggest takeaway or what were some of the takeaways that you got uh, from reading this book um, before I start my takeaways I just have to say I don't know anything about Buddhism um, so <laughs> reading this book i was jumping myself in <laughs> um, yeah it's like it's my... like jumping into the deep end too because it's like really like high level buddhist thought and it's also mm -hmm. i noticed like kind of high level uh like psychology like socio mm -hmm. psychology psychiatry talk too because i took some psychology classes in college and i was remembering some of the terms and being like oh god i haven't thought about like psychoanalytic transference since i was like half asleep in my like like 7 30 class mm -hmm. yeah that was uh my big thing i i have a little list right here and the one big thing i don't know if you can see it is therapy i wrote it i said therapy <laughs> underlined it <laughs> yeah it definitely seemed to um talk a lot about uh the buddhist uh or the buddhism uh method into uh psychology i guess or therapy and the way that uh mark epstein was using it that in his role as a therapist and he, he did a lot of uh comparing it to freud which was really mm -hmm. interesting to see uh, and hear about the different uh, methods and how they uh, they differed and maybe some of the, the ways in, in which they still sort of borrowed from each other. Um, yeah, but, I thought it was I thought it was super interesting. You could kind of tell what time period he had come up in like psychology uh, because of all the mentions of like Freud and all of this and all of that, which is like when I was in my psychology classes, obviously we learned about Freud. It would be hard not to, but like it was uh, like the uh, heavy, um, heavy emphasis on like psychoanalysis and like the in the ego and the super ego that was just sort of, they were showing you like one framework of like, this is how, you know, this is one way of looking at it and here are some other ones and he was very like very deep in like well this is how freud says but <laughs> yeah and he also mentioned the lsd uh experiments oh, so that mm -hmm. was my uh hands down my favorite part of the book <laughs> uh, um i came out of this book going you know who I want to know more about? His buddy Ram Das, aka <laughs> Richard Alpert, which made me throw my book I, across the. Uh, I I, so I'm currently rewatching Lost, like literally right at this moment, and I was like, I can't wait to talk to Rebecca about how we got a Richard Alpert name drop in this book. I was wondering if it was just me because no, it I didn't make like, me stop in my tracks a little bit. The bit that my highlight is just Richard Alpert, like, but also that dude's life. I want to um, sign me up for that newsletter because <laughs> when so they they talk about Mark Epstein. He um, went to Harvard. He went to medical school, became a psychiatrist, and while and also went and did all these Buddhist practices and things like that. And in these Buddhist practices, he met a former. I think he was a former Harvard professor 
who got kicked out of Harvard because of all of his experiments with LSD. Harvard was like, hey, could you stop with the LSD? And he was like, <laughs> no, I can't. And, uh, <laughs> and then he went and like uh, <laughs> went to all these countries and like learned Buddhism and like came back. And the guy who fired him at Harvard liked him so much he was like hey dude you want to just chill at my house and like teach your meditations and he was like yeah i do so, sorry about firing you and that's a summary of uh, <laughs> what i learned about rob das but i want to know so much more now <laughs> this is just the introduction to something that uh is w wanting you to pursue something uh in in addition to this uh that's so funny uh, yes, the Richard Albert name drop uh, was the best. <laughs> I learned that the seventies were a wild time where they were like LSD. Like we can, we should use this. Like let's all just take drop some acid. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> but for science, <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Well, well, in their defense, in their in their scientific defense, I guess there are things about LSD that open up parts of the mind. <laughs> yes, and so they yeah, were, and, they were and trying it, to measure it, I guess. And it was like the seventies, or LSD was like the new thing that had just come out, and people didn't really know that much about it. Like it was, they weren't just like, "Hey, dude, let's just like go off and take some LSD." But uh, yes, Julia says uh, LSD for science, exactly. But it's just it's so funny, like reading back on um, some of these experiments that they did in like the in like the 60s and the 70s where they were like what can we do with LSD and it's like oh can you imagine being on that campus with that teacher where he's just like out of his mind <laughs> on LSD and I forget who they mention in the, who he mentions in the book uh he he goes to somewhere I don't know if it was in Tibet or somewhere and and Ram Das I guess takes the LSD <laughs> yeah. to to a, a Buddhist leader or monk or something and gives him all this LSD thinking that it's going to like mess him up. And, and the guy's like, what, you got any more of it? It's not, it's not really doing anything for me. <laughs> my, my favorite part. And once again, Ram Das being the shining star of this book is that, <laughs> <laughs> is that like at one point, Ram Das was like, oh, okay, I'm going to give him more LSD. It's like, Ram Das, calm down, first of all. Uh, but then he was like, I'll just give him a higher dosage. And then the monk trolls Ram Das. He was like, <laughs> he pretends to be really messed up. And Ram Das is like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And he's like, nah, dude, I'm just chill. I'm just chilling. <laughs> yeah, that was the second time. And yeah, he yeah. like went back and then tricked him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is so funny. Yeah, he definitely Amazing. did troll him. Uh, that's a great way to put it. Um, <laughs> I so, love that dude. <laughs> <laughs> so Morgan, is that kind of your biggest takeaway as Ram Dass from this book? <laughs> I mean, it sounds no, it's probably not, but but <laughs> they were they those were probably the stories that I enjoyed the most because it was just there was such a like a sense of place. Like I was just like I felt like I was kind of in the 70s. I don't know if either of you guys have watched like wild wild country on netflix um but if you haven't i cannot recommend it high enough it's about uh what they were called like the regish the regish Puran or the regish it was basically this like in the 70s and 60s and 70s there was like this real push about being really interested in like eastern religions um and this kind of this religious uh figure comes over to this small town in um the u.s i think it was oregon or I, I could be wrong, but basically they set up like an, a commune and they kind of slowly like take over the whole community and then it gets crazier from there. But it kind of reminded me of like that sense of place and time, like this time in the seventies where everybody was kind of searching for something. They were just kind of like looking for something more. And, uh, and that like that Eastern philosophy of thought, like uh, a lot of Americans were getting really interested in it. And so you kind of see that where he was like, uh, yeah, my, my, my teachers in the Buddhist way, Jack and John. And you're like, <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, but uh, for, for Jack and John, whoever those people were, uh, they, they did spend time in yeah. uh, the, the countries in where, where that study uh, was applicable. So good for them. And it was a lot of young folks. Uh, they mentioned people in their 20s and things like that. So yeah, that was, like, that was, was really a, interesting. He was a meditation master. I And I needed to learn from him. He was 28 years old. And I was like, <laughs> get out of here. I don't want to learn anything from a 28-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> what do they know? What do they know? Um, yeah. Uh, so I, for me, I... Um, 
some of some of the therapists therapy talk and some of the the buddhism sort of you know i was trying to you know grapple with you know the lingo and everything uh but i think the stories uh, when he would talk about his travels and his experiences with those people i thought for me that was the most interesting part because i i could grab a hold of the stories and the the interesting people he he connected with but uh when i when i thought about like what is this book about <laughs> well uh mark epstein actually tells us what the book is about he says this book is about <laughs> which is very helpful <laughs> how i came to rest more easily in my own awareness to live more fully in my own self and about how others may do the same it is about what makes it possible to live in an uninterrupted flow absorbed in the moment in accordance with one's truest self this is a potential for all of us uh, one whose actualization depends on our abilities to see ourselves as we truly are we can change not through clinging to notions of who we think we are but through opening up our own capacities for self-awareness so yeah a lot go ahead. of long sentences in this book i just want to put that out there a lot of long sentences <laughs> i was like whoa we're still going a lot of the, i was like is this a paragraph and, oh no no we're still in that sentence <laughs> just a, a lot of really deep thoughts uh which <laughs> really which, was which uh, was mind uh opening <laughs> um so uh i guess that that aspect of it really um reading that passage i guess i should say is uh what sort of got me into the supergirl relevance uh to this book so uh i'm curious i i, I have my thoughts about <laughs> how how uh this book was chosen because it's not an accident that this book was chosen for its appearance on supergirl in season five there's a reason that uh lena walks in with that book um but i'm gonna wait and, until uh we kind of go around the book club as it were to share our thoughts so uh so abby why do you think this book in particular we've talked about ram das We've talked about um, the <laughs> LSD trials. We've talked about all that stuff. Why uh, Why do you think this book specifically was chosen for Lena to give it to Kara after the unfortunate uh, murder of Jeremiah Danvers? Dun, dun, uh, dun. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first uh, reason why I think it was chosen was because of the title, Going on Being. And then you can think, well, going on being what and who? So I think the title within itself is a, is a message without even looking at the pages inside. So what are Lena and Kara gonna be beyond that? Um, and then when I was reading the book, uh, uh, something that really jumped out to me was, as this is also a memoir, was uh, Mark's experience in France where he was uh, alienated. He, as a child, went to France for a couple weeks and he didn't know the language, he didn't know the family. And so that alienation is so familiar to Kara for coming into uh, a new world, to Lena for coming into the Luthers. And then from there, I started making other connections, whether that's from uh, the different metaphors and or the, the couple agreement uh, example where uh, Mark was saying that when he was with a, with a client, they were in an argument and they would never agree with each other because they both, they both had different ways of resolving the problem. One was saying, oh, let's forget it. Um, the agreements, it's done, the argument, it's done. But then the other, the other person wanted to keep going on and on and on and trying to figure out and going back to the issue and all that stuff. So it was, as I underlined all my all, and you can kind of maybe see lots of underlines and, <laughs> Pages uh, kind of dog folded. Um, I love it. Those are my kind of amazing. Notes. Yes, just so when I read it and then I re looked it over, it was those types of things that really stuck out to me. There was um, another example of where Mark, his daughter, was in a softball game and she got hit with a softball and she almost broke her nose, all this stuff. And then her the daughter had to write a paper after or wrote a paper after about it. And the line that she used was, a softball is not soft. So nothing's <laughs> like it seems, <laughs> which is exactly what happened with the Kara and Lena relationship. Kara was not what Lena thought. And then going into the season, Kara was not what, or Lena was not what Kara thought uh, with Nano Churi and everything was going on. So I think this book is the, I guess, like a, token to their friendship is saying, hey, like there's all these examples in, in here that relate to us. So let's figure it out. But then also on top of it, the last one of the last chapters is about death. So 
how can Kara move on from losing Jeremiah too? And that maybe Lena's there as a friend to help her with that. I yeah. love I love having these kinds of discussions because that's so cool. Some of those insights I did not put together. E everything, at all, and I love everything, it. yeah, everything <laughs> you just said, I that those are not in my notes. So I love <laughs> that you bring a different perspective to it, and I, I think uh, I think you're right that a lot of that is them trying to uh, f sort of understand each other a little bit better because a lot of the book is about identity and sort of finding your truest self and and things like that. And I guess we should. Um, uh, define some things uh, for people who didn't read the book because you mentioned going on being and um, he he talks uh, one of the a uh, couple of things he he mentions in regards to going on being uh, he says going on being does not need to connote any fixed entity of self but it does imply a stream of unimpeded awareness ever evolving yet with continuity uniqueness and integrity and he also uh, says a couple of things sorry uh, if it sounds like it's a lot of stuff it's because I made a lot of notes. He also <laughs> says, uh, going on being implies an intrinsic but elusive process of self-discovery and self-creation. And he also said that going on being implies the capacity to live in a fully awareness and creative state unimpeded by constraints or expectations. He likes the word unimpeded. He does. Uh, <laughs> which which I need to uh, <laughs> to add to my vocabulary because it is <laughs> it's a strong word. Uh, so uh, if you needed the context of what going on being meant or what uh, he wrote about in the book that's sort of if if you can wrap your mind around those definitions that that's some of the stuff he mentioned with that yeah um, he talks a lot about like the buddhist concept of like the middle way hmm. um sort of being n not cr like not critical of yourself but also not giving into like negative emotions so kind of seeing a negative emotion and letting it be which I thought was kind of interesting, the idea of like not judging it or not saying, I have to fix this. I think that was a big part of, of the book was talking about how um, some psychotherapy or therapy in general talks about, you know, diving into your problems and fixing them. And um, from a Buddhist perspective, like you can't, you're not probably not going to fix your problems. Like they talk about some of the, you know, the Buddhist masters where they'd say, Oh, did, did you, you know, did you get over that? And he's like, no, I didn't. Uh, so this idea of, you know, your, your issues and your, your problems, you don't have to fix or solve everything, but you can learn how to like live with things and you can learn how to, you know, be present in the moment. And I thought that was interesting when you're looking at the Kara and Lena relationship, because to a certain extent, going on being is about living in the present moment and sort of letting go of the past and not being worried about the future and sort of uh, fully inhabiting your present. Um, or at least that's kind of what I got out of the, all those long sentences. And, <laughs> and so, I mean, if you think, if you apply that to the car and Lena relationship, I think it makes a lot of sense because the idea of like, they can't change what happened they can't change that car didn't tell lena or didn't trust her and, um, and lena locked car and and i think of ice they with can't some tonight in there they that. can't change they that. can't change the time that lena like maybe accidentally uploaded a robot into a former friend listen all water under the bridge <laughs> she was being petty lena it's okay she was she was mad you know she but <laughs> she clearly hadn't read this book yet um, no <laughs> which i was very surprised about yeah. <laughs> yeah i know she said she read it all the time when dealing with all luther situations but mm. i'm reading some stuff and i'm like there is no way like this fits with her little boxes theory that she <laughs> yeah, she yeah. told brainy it's yeah, I literally wrote her little about boxes question mark <laughs> in my book. <laughs> yeah, her theory is that like you take all the bad feelings and you just shove them down, you shove them down, and then you lock that box, and nothing bad is ever going to happen when you just <laughs> shove it into the corner. It's never going to pop open, and you're never going to freak out and upload a robot into somebody you used to like. Everything's cool. Uh, <laughs> and this book is kind of like uh, sit with the bad feeling let yourself feel a bad feeling, let the bad feeling go. Meanwhile, Lena's like sitting there with like, um, like Inspector Gadget, like petting the bad feeling, like, oh, this is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know that she, I don't think that she made the notes in her book that you did, Abby, because I, I feel like some of it kind of left. But I, I think that that idea of like living in the present is 
kind of like a good thing for Cara and Lena. Like if they could let go of the past and kind of just be with their relationship as it is and kind of accept the bad at with the good and just kind of move forward, I think that they would be okay. So I kind of do see that as like an interesting way of looking at that relationship. It's really interesting because my takeaway in terms of the the relevance to Supergirl is that it, this book, uh, Lena handing it to Kara is almost Lena talking about herself is what I got out of it. Um, because I think that um, uh, Lena's given this book to Kara as a message that Lena has changed because the book is a lot about uh, change and your identity and uh transitioning yourself from kind of one thing to another. It also talks about, um, uh, let's see, uh, uh, the being set free from some things. Uh, there, uh, he talked about something called the intrinsic reality instinct, uh, that the tendency to see a false and absolute identity in people and in things, uh, whether you could uh, see something or nothing or being a somebody or a nobody. And that that was kind of the middle path that you were talking about, Morgan. There was a, there a whole thing about instinct versus spirit. And um, I, I sort of took that as Lena wanting to be uh, set free and not be constrained to, to being either good or bad. And I first, I, I sort of just saw this as like Lena acknowledging that maybe she had done some bad things in the past, but maybe she had <laughs> she had the capacity for good, but hasn't always leaned into it because the book says at the heart of all of us is the potential for kindness, genera uh, generosity, and wisdom. And uh, so I just saw this as um, uh, Lena giving the book to Kara as her Lena's acknowledgement. Uh, for Kara, like saying, hey, read this. This is kind of a book about how I've changed and uh, <laughs> trying trying to get her to read it. So I saw this book more about Lena and sort of what she was going through. So not so much about Kara and Lena and their friendship, although I like Abby's thoughts about it also connecting to the death of Jeremiah through that chapter yeah. uh, on death. I think that's that's a really good point that I didn't think about. But I sort of I sort of saw this as Lena being like, here is a book about what I'm going through. Please read it. So that's kind of what <laughs> that's kind of what I took away from it. Well, it's, it's funny. I saw I saw stuff in the book though that also reminded me of Kara. Although I mm. didn't put together what Abby said about the um, that experience in uh, Paris kind of mirroring Kara, and I think that's super cool. It's gonna like really change how I look at that. But um, there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff in the book about splitting the self into parts instead of looking at the whole mm -hmm. of the self, it's like, this is the part of me that's angry, or this is the part of me that doesn't even want to do this assignment or, you know, stuff like that, where um, he talks about when he was in therapy, he would kind of um, like make himself a third person when he was talking, like a part of me only wants to do this or a part of me wants to do that. And his therapist would stop him and be like, no, you you know, there's no part of you, there's just you. And I thought about that <clears throat> in relation to Kara and how she's kind of split herself into parts, right? So she's got the Supergirl part and she's got the Kara Danvers part. And she's kind of, she's kind of split herself off into all these different, you know, um, sections. There's like, you know, the section that, you know, maybe wants to get in a relationship with William, but like, obviously she can't tell him anything. And there's a section that wants to be a good sister and a section that wants to be a good friend and the section, you know, that wants to be a good superhero. And I think that that was interesting to me that the idea of like splitting um, the parts versus having it be whole. And I think we've seen that with Kara in, I can't, I think it was season three, when she was like, I'm just Supergirl now, like, Cara yeah, Danvers was, is gone. <laughs> yeah, Cara Danvers sucks right now. Yeah, yeah. that was the, the beginning of season three. That's a really good point, because uh, Cara in season five had to deal with her secret identity when it came to Lena. She had to uh, have that really awesome scene at the beginning of season five where she confesses to Lena about being Supergirl. And so I think that was her dealing with those parts of her and trying to make that a, a whole being that uh, she, she finally came to. So that's a, that's a really good point. Uh, there were a couple of things that I also thought applied to Lena though. Uh, Mark says at one point uh, about going on being, he says, even intelligence could be an obstacle to going on being. So that made me think of Lena cause she's high, high IQ. <laughs> and uh, so, so a lot of this to me, I thought, um, had to had to do with Lena, but I like the idea that there's there's aspects of Kara in here as well. 
Yeah, Morgan, yeah. did you have something else? Yeah, I'm just, I'm skimming through my notes uh, <laughs> that I was writing like on my phone while I was reading. <laughs> I was like, I, I was like just talking the the notes onto it. So I was just be like, we we have to awaken to change. And like, like any, <laughs> anybody who walked past me would have been like, is she okay? <laughs> is she, has she gotten sucked into some sort of cult situation? Um, but I think there, uh, there's one in, uh, thing that he said where something about the desire for things to be different is the root of suffering and that we keep trying to manage what cannot be changed. And I think that's definitely something interesting for, you know, when we talk about um, both Lena and Cara, the idea of them always trying to sort of manage what's going on and be the, you know, be in control of everything. And I think that's something that both of those characters share. Yeah. And uh, he, he definitely did talk about the, the suffering. And one of the things I also thought was really interesting was the idea of, he talked about, I, I couldn't exactly grab hold of it, but the, the, I am versus the, I am not, um, so w <laughs> which, which I, which I, I guess sort of played into the idea of being your truest self and your uh, seeking identity. And it made me wonder, um, I don't know, maybe this could apply to both Kara and Lena, and I kind of want y'all's thoughts on this. Um, what do you think, I guess we can start uh, with Lena, because that, that's the one I think is the most interesting. Mm -hmm. um, what would Lena say she is, and what would Lena say she is not? Because I wonder, I wonder if that would have changed from the beginning of season five until the time that she gave Kara that book. I'm very curious about that because I was that was one of the questions I was trying to think Ooh. about. So I, um, I wonder if I, if y'all, yeah, go ahead, Abby. Oh yeah, sorry. I was gonna say I think a big thing would be whether or not Lex is alive in that Luther name, because what she did at the end of season four by killing him versus season five. Oh, he's he's alive again after Crisis. So I that's a I think depending on on where she is in regards to that, that's a a big change because as we saw in the fortress, she's says she killed her brother for you, Kara, and for her for your friends or her friends. Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you think that would be in relation to uh, her as a Luther? Would she would she say you know? I, I I guess I guess my question is like, would she admit to like would she accept being a Luther? I guess is what I'm I'm trying to to mm -hmm. wonder about because because you mentioned Lex because uh, she's mm -hmm. always been trying to fight that in terms of uh, her Luther identity. So I think that's a really interesting point that you bring up about uh, whether or not Lex is in the picture. Yeah, and I think that the mm -hmm. the Luther side of her is interesting when you are like looking at this book um, as it talks about the idea of um, the positive and negative being able to um, coincide in the same person in the same, you know, being and, and to not, you know, be so be so focused on, you know, fixing things or changing things and to just kind of know yourself and like move forward from that. And so I think that that's interesting when you look at somebody like Lena, who is, you know, obviously trying to shove those Luther feelings into, into a tiny, tiny box. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, one of the, one of the notes that I made was um, from, from the book. And I have no idea where this was in because I didn't put any page notes or direct quotes. It was just, don't fear feelings. So again, uh, it does sound like if anybody had walked by me, they would just think that I was writing a self-help book. I'm just like, <laughs> don't feel fe fear feelings, abandonment and <laughs> retaliation. Uh, but but I think that there is a certain like for for Lena, she does kind of fear her feelings, and uh, and that's why she has to put all of those negative feelings in a box that obviously. Uh, opens up, uh, explodes in a way in season five that is not helpful for everybody um, <laughs> where she feels betrayed and she kind of just lets those feelings go. Um, so I think that that's kind of an interesting idea of like looking at it from the Lena perspective and seeing like may maybe what could she take from this book that she's apparently read a couple of times um, that maybe would help her out because there's all a lot of talk about um, fearing abandonment. Um, one mm -hmm. of his patients, it was very afraid of um, being abandoned, like uh, like she had been by her father. And so she would like simultaneously wait for people to abandon her and also try to push people away. And I think we kind of see that with Lena in the flashbacks where Carr is trying to become friends with her. And she's like, hey, you know, you want to get a coffee? And she was like, uh, no, 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 you don't want to be my friend. Bye. 
car's like, okay, it's. I think cool, we even cool see that with uh, Andrea <laughs> now too, with those flashbacks. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, to play devil's advocate, does Lena really fear her feelings? Because she she might not uh, tell them outright, but she definitely feels them. She uh, oh no, she, she feels she, them. <laughs> she feels them real hard. <laughs> so, so my theory about Lena is that the the bad feelings that she feels, she she puts them into those little boxes, but nobody's little feelings boxes ever just stay in the corner of their feelings attic. Uh, mm. They eventually break free. And so when those feelings boxes break free, she does something like try to mind control the world. Like, whereas <laughs> if she maybe just went to like a cardio kickboxing class uh, or a little therapy, uh, maybe just like this it book out. said over and over and over again, <laughs> yeah, maybe just go to therapy, Lena, just go to therapy. Uh, maybe what would you think? Uh, not Kelly would think Jerry. of the book. That's interesting. That is a good question. Because for a lot of season five, we were trying to figure out what Kelly does. Uh, so I, I think that uh, would be interesting. Because uh, Kelly seems to uh, operate out of, out of people, tr I guess, trying to uh, address their trauma. Wasn't she like a, a military. military? Yeah, yeah. she was yeah. in the military. So it seems like she deals a lot with uh, PTSD and things like that. So it seems like... And correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I sort of assume that she was one of those people who wanted to address the problems head on and maybe not and maybe not so much fixing them as, as we talked about, but being able to overcome them. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, that's a good question. Uh, Abby, do you have an answer to that? What do you think Kelly would think of the book? Um, I it would. Oh, first, it would depend on if she knew whether or not Kara is Supergirl, because I think it would be, it, if she was looking at like patient wise, well, could then she would know more about Kara and Supergirl and the different parts as we, say, as we said um, in the book, it's like breaking yourself up in parts in the alienation. And um, so I, I think, I guess overall, uh, she would like it to a point but not to rely on it. Um, that there are different coping strategies in the book. Um, at, on one page, it was saying that the brain is like a Chinese box and there's different boxes and all that kind of stuff. Um, but not to necessarily, like there's other options, like in the Super Bowl universe, there, is, there was uh, like Obsidian North and using that different technology. So even though like Buddhism is, this old technique and religion and all all that that there's options today as well and to kind of use those tools and combine it that makes yeah sense. that's a, that's, a, that's a good point because even though we were a little bit confused about what kelly does she definitely <laughs> did use the obsidian tech to try to help people uh through therapy using that technology so that's a really good point and uh just want to reiterate uh paula, <laughs> paula makes a great point that uh like abby mentioned we don't know if uh, Kelly knows that Kara is Supergirl, that has never been addressed no idea. Uh, since <laughs> since season four. We have no idea. So I uh, just want to uh, make sure that everybody is uh, uh, remembering <laughs> that correctly. Uh, let's see. I guess oh, we can get Kelly. to um, some of the uh, comments. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, Yvonne uh, says that Kara needs to overcome her hero complex and Lena needs to overcome her family traumas. Yeah, so I think uh, those are some good... Uh, points to talk about in terms of their characters. And I, I wonder, maybe it, maybe in some way, Lena was giving this book to Kara to try to, I don't know. I, I, she definitely seemed to be, in, in the context of the season, uh, reaching out to Kara in a way um, to to sort of uh, bridge that gap and kind of uh, almost like a, like a white flag a little bit. Uh, here, here's a book that, you know, the paperback version costs $970. <laughs> <laughs> it's made with real diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give this book to you just to, you know, uh, start, start a conversation. Uh, so maybe, maybe part of that, just the act of giving her the book is her trying to reach out. So uh, they definitely both have things they can work on in terms of uh, their identities and their truest selves, I guess, if you want to say it that way. Um, so that's a, that's a really interesting point. Now this uh, this isn't deep or profound, but did you notice that the they made a Batman reference in this book? No, remind me yeah. what 
So he he says something about hold on oh, I jotted oh, it down because oh, I thought he, it was he funny. He did mention a Batman <laughs> um, Batman movie. Yeah, he said something was like um like Batman stuck inside a room whose walls are so, slowly compressing. That's being like uh, stuck between two patterns of thinking, uh, being critical and being self pitying. So those are the two sides of the wall that are uh, like cr uh, crushing you. I think that that really can relate to Lena as well, especially with some of the ways that she reacted to the, the whole situation with Kara. Cause I do think that she was really mad on one side and she was kind of self-pitying like a lot of it was about like well why didn't you tell me why didn't why you was tell i me? good enough why wasn't i good enough yeah fo focusing more on what it meant about her as a person versus what it might have meant to Kara specifically and i think that she was kind of trapped in that batman box of the walls closing <laughs> in on her uh and not being able to see uh, a different way or a different perspective I don't know that I've seen that Batman movie. There's only really no. <laughs> one. I haven't either. One Batman movie that he might have been thinking of. There's a there's a an Adam West uh, Batman sixty six. That there's Batman the movie. Some it's called. That's the one with the famous. Uh, uh, shark bomb, uh, the the bomb what? that he carries. Uh, you, you know the the shark repellent and the bomb that he carries over his head. You you never seen that gift where he's like running with the bomb? I clearly need to. You've never amazing. seen that. That's like old school internet meme. This oh is, man, this, I missed this, that. This, and this I was yelling at and I was yelling at Mike the other day for not knowing the uh, Lex Luthor cakes meme. But I feel like this is that's a, I've shamed that's myself. A deep, that's a deep dive. The Lex and the forty cakes. That's, that's a that's a deep dive. Uh, but but uh, we're gonna have to school you on the the Batman with the <laughs> Clearly. bomb. Clearly. Uh, but I mean, if you're gonna talk about uh, walls closing in, why not reference uh, Star Wars: A New Hope? That seems yeah, that's true. Yeah, that seems like a more direct uh, with the with the garbage uh, uh, scene. So yeah, uh, <laughs> that, that was how I read that. I was like, okay, I like Batman, but. You really you're missing out the Star Wars uh, <laughs> analogy here, uh, so yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Um, let's see. Did uh, you uh, see that it was mentioned two times uh, about a talking horse? What? Oh. No, I maybe <laughs> I my that. Oh, that's right, Mister Ed. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It mentioned it twice, so I I figured. Might have, I incredible. have to mention it because we, you know, we may have our own talking horse on the show. Well, never know. Um, yeah, uh, comment is coming. <laughs> any, any time I learned in college, anytime somebody repeats something, it, they want you to, they want you to uh, grab onto that. So, uh, yeah, if he mentioned Mister uh, Mister Ed uh, a lot, and that uh, again, that was one of the things that put me in the time the time period of things. Mr. Ed was a TV yeah. show I think, from the fifties, probably, I don't know if it was early or late fifties. Um, but that would have been something that he maybe grew up watching. I don't know. I think, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that was, that was interesting. Yes. Good call about the talking <laughs> horse. Very relevant to super. That's so funny. I did. I like read that section and I didn't even put it together. It's like talking horses. Comet 2021. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, in um, therapy, it's comet and therapy. That's what I got. From comet, the book. And, yeah, comet and therapy. Uh, we next season on Supergirl, we need comet. We need therapy. So much therapy these two need. <laughs> well, and uh, you've got at least one character that can uh, help out with that. Uh, I'd like to see Kelly utilize <laughs> if she in this if, way. If she can, like, maybe she can be a therapist instead of uh, having to manage bug fixes for Obsidian. <laughs> yeah, the technology side of it uh, seemed to be something she had to uh, to to learn. That that was a uh, on the job training, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't really her field. She's like, um, I'm, I'm logging these bugs, and they're never getting fixed. What's happening? <laughs> <laughs> IT oh, is evil. <laughs> oh, that Eve Tessmacher. <laughs> she was messing things up. Um, okay, so. Um, uh, anybody else have any thoughts about going on being, uh, whether or not it was something, I guess we can wrap up our thoughts about the book and I, I, I want to get, uh, to some questions uh, about Abby and reading and the book list. Um, so, uh, last, last, uh, chance for thoughts about the book or its relevance to Supergirl. Uh, Abby, I'll start with you. Uh, basically, uh, therapy and talking horses. Um, my big takeaway um, on it was, uh, and what I enjoyed the most was all the metaphors and the different experiences uh, that the author shared with us. Um, and there was one example that I hadn't mentioned. It was about how 
there like how one place where he was the trap monkeys they took like a coconut and they made they put food in the coconut and they made a little tiny hole so the monkey would reach in to grab the food and then it would try and reach out but because it the hole was too small for the fist it wouldn't it would it would get stuck so and it wouldn't let go of the food so then that's how it got captured and i think that relates to a lot of things not only in Supergirl and Lena and Kara and all those characters, but in the world today, is that we're all maybe holding on stuff uh, too tightly, um, and sometimes we just have to let loose and or figure out like what are what are we doing and how can our actions change the future, and how can that be a positive experience for us instead of getting trapped and being caught in in these negativities. That's a really good point. And I also wonder if there's a, a way that we we just don't grab in at all. Like, is there a way to prevent ourselves from <laughs> reaching in to begin yeah. with so we don't get trapped? Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a really good, uh, really good point. Um, Morgan, do you have any sort of final takeaways uh, from uh, this this great book about Ram Dass and, and Richard Alpert, Alpert and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I jot it down. The, just the phrase oceanic feeling because of oceanic. And I was like, I was like, dude, dude, is this all, it's all connected. I was like, I, I was, maybe I was on the LSD. I was putting together connections from like lost and Supergirl, was pinning it all together on the board with string. I was like, it's all connected. Um, <laughs> he did include the word ocean. Yeah. It, it, um, it's funny. Cause I, because I, I would love to read like a book on like Lost and philosophy because Lost used a lot of names of like, you know, obviously of John like, famous Locke. Buddhists. Yeah. But yeah. philosophers and scientists and stuff like that. So it doesn't it, I don't it, I don't think it's past Lost to have, you know, maybe oceanic feeling is an idea in <laughs> Buddhism. <laughs> and they were like, what should we make the airline? <laughs> um but on a, on a more serious note, what I liked about the book was sort of the focus on, um, I jotted it down towards the end. I think he was kind of restating some of his thesis where he was talking about the healing power of awareness, like the idea of staring, like staring yourself uh, and, and really seeing yourself as who you are instead of constantly trying to fix everything, instead of constantly striving for this or striving for that, that and not being happy in the moment because you're going to be happy once you get this other thing or you're going to be happy once you do this. Um, just doing what you're doing and being present in the moment instead of being like, you know, you're reading something, but then you look, check your phone, but then you do this, but oh no, I didn't do the laundry. And then that time that you were supposed to spend, you know, reading and enjoying the book, like you didn't do any of that because you were worrying or you were, you know, futzing with something else or you were supposed to be watching a TV show, but you checked Twitter five times and you've rewound <laughs> twice. Uh, uh, and I'm not speaking from experience, but I do this a lot. And so <laughs> I found I found myself like, you know, jotting notes down, not just for this book club to talk about Car and Lena, but just to be like, yeah, I should live more in the moment. And I should when I'm doing something, I should do it. And I think that's something that where all of our attention spans are so pulled to the breaking point. There's always 10 hundred things happening everything's happening at once. You have to do five things all the time. It seems like now and nobody, and it feels like a lot of us, we don't just do what we're doing while we're doing it. Uh, and I think that's part of what he was talking about going on being is like being present in the moment. Like he gives an example early in the book, I think where it's like a Buddhist master and he's reading the paper and eating breakfast. And his students are like, I thought you were only supposed to do one thing at a time, dude, <laughs> why are you doing both? And he was like, well, that while you're eating breakfast, and reading the paper, just eat breakfast and read the paper. Right. Like he's like, just do what you're doing. And I thought that that was that that I found really interesting. And uh, and I I think it can apply to Supergirl. I think uh, not just to the characters, but to the show itself. Uh, I think this this book could be, maybe be helpful for whoever when you're writing a show about Supergirl. Perhaps write a show about Supergirl. Um, perhaps that's it. Like maybe you're overthinking it. Maybe you're, <laughs> maybe there's too many storylines. Maybe there's too much going on. Maybe you just want to be in the moment of the character whose show is the title. <laughs> it's, it's, 
It's a thought. We're just <laughs> we're just throwing it out there. Uh, speaking of overcomplicating things, uh, my my thing that I kind of wanted to wrap up this discussion on was uh, the Nasrudin uh, lost key yes. story. Yeah. So so in the book, I, I think it's fair for us to sort of debate it because in the book he mentions that a lot of people he would go around and ask a lot of people what the story meant and and, and give. And, and he shows a, a couple of different angles on that Nasruddin story where it's like, maybe it means this. Maybe it yeah. means that. Like, I thought it was interesting how he, like, would bring it back in several different chapters, but with different readings on it. Because I'll be honest with you, I got a little frustrated with that story because I was like, the whole, the, the, the solution <laughs> to that story is you take the light inside the house, Right. That's that's the solution. Because <laughs> if people didn't read the book and you don't know about Nasruddin and the Lost Key, there's a guy outside and he's like looking on the floor or whatever, and he, and and a, another guy comes up and says, "Hey, hey, man, what?" Are you, and I'm paraphrasing. This is probably not exactly the dialogue, but he's like, "Hey, man, wh what are you doing?" And the guy says, "I'm looking for my Lost Key." And uh, he's and the other guy says, "You know, where where'd you last have it?" And the, and the guy looking for the key says, uh, uh, "In the house." And uh, the guy who comes up to him says, "Oh, why are you looking out here then? If 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 it's in the house, and and the guy looking for the keys, like, because there's more light out here." And I was like, <laughs> "What a dum dum! You're never gonna find the key. The key <laughs> is obviously in the house because if that's the last place you had it, you should be looking in there. Just take a candle, take a flashlight, take whatever you need, <laughs> take the light in the house." Because I got it frustrated because like the the like the really like uh, high intelligence answer to that was looking is the answer. And I was like, <laughs> no, looking is not the answer. The answer is taking light into the house. I got so frustrated with We're that because smarter, not harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just yeah. I just kind of thought you're you're making this too complicated. You're not really you're never going to find that key is what I sort of t took away from that. I was like. I, I give up trying to help you fight and find the key because uh, that's just <laughs> not the thing. So I just wondered if like y'all had any thoughts about that. Um, I'm open to interpretations. I certainly have my solution to the problem. <laughs> but, but, if, if, but if you all have uh, thoughts that you took away from that Nasruddin story, uh, feel free to share them. Anybody? Um, I felt the same way. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, yeah, I... I <laughs> Um, and I felt like I was back in my ethics class where we got in college and we got all these like different scenarios and it was all these different answers and it got so complicated and people are just sitting there. It's like, well, just do the common sense thing. And so that's what, that's what it kind of felt like. It's like, take a flashlight, turn on a light switch, you know, <laughs> but it's, uh, you it's know all where it is. people's different interpretations. I respect everyone's opinions for it. And, you know, and I like seeing different, everyone's different answers, but I mean, what would I do in that situation? Flip the light switch. Yeah. 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 I think, I think that's interesting. And I, I liked all the different like perspectives that he gave in the book of like, you know, the, the, what was it? The one was like searching is the, is the answer. And another one was like, you have to look where the light is like, you know, focus on the light. Like it's, it's very positive, but also I think you could have flipped that into a, obviously a very negative story. Are you not just looking in the wrong direction? Are you not spending all of your time uh, yeah. on something that's never going to get you where you want to be. So I think that there's also, you know, there's the, you know, the sort of wise way of looking at it. And then there's a practical way of looking at it, which is like, you know, turn on a light, <laughs> like <laughs> you can do it. Uh, but then I think there's also like, you know, if you kind of think about it as like a lot of us spend a lot of time, you know, searching for that key outside in the light, because that's where we think we should be. But like, we're, you know, searching in the wrong location. We're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. That is such a wise thing you just mentioned, Morgan. I am, I well, am. I mean, I've been reading this, this book about Buddhism and I'm like, <laughs> I'm doing the middle way now, man. <laughs> <laughs> I did not think about that. And now I really like that. I like the, uh, cause that sort of eases my frustration with it is that the the moral of the story is the the guy is looking in the wrong place and <laughs> and you shouldn't be that guy so that sort of uh, makes it uh have a different meaning for me so i really appreciate you sharing sharing the, your thoughts so i thought that was something fun we could debate because that's uh 
it sounded like that had been debated, I guess, in, in Buddhist circles for a long, long time. So, uh, so I, I thought that was fair that we could uh, debate it amongst ourselves to see, see what wise uh, answers that uh, we could, <laughs> we could get to. So <laughs> don't look in the wrong place is what we're saying. Look in the, the place uh, where, where you last think you've lost the keys. That's also just turn on lights always turn on lights if that's uh, how you're gonna find stuff that's how you're you gonna can find see it. it go inside turn on a light <laughs> just go inside in general you know what time period we're living in just be inside <laughs> fun fun fact i'm gonna make a confession about something stupid that happened to me today um i rubbed my eye a lot today and i wear contacts and uh i could tell that my contact was probably not my eye anymore because if i don't have my contacts in uh it's just all a blur and uh, i was at a friend's house and i was like uh, I think something happened to my contact and she looked down and she could see it on the floor. Like I couldn't <laughs> see it because obviously I was blind. So if, if I, if she had not looked in the place where it obviously could have fallen, <laughs> yeah. but she looked outside of the house, she would never have spotted it. And I would have had to go around the rest of the day with uh, a half of my vision. So the big takeaway is just look, look where it's reasonable uh, to have been lost. So uh, that's, that's what I, uh, uh, took from that. So Paula has an interesting one. She says the guy is looking in the easy place. It has light. Instead of looking in the hard place, it is dark. Ooh, which I, I like a lot. Actually, I yeah, that's a good. That's a good interpretation. Uh, yeah, uh, Priscilla also says uh, Occam Razor. Uh, the the simplest, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. easiest way to an answer is is the best. Uh, that's kind of uh, my my sort of uh, solution to it. Um, yeah, so those are those are some great uh, uh, interpretations. I think we all learned a little bit something here today. Uh, so that's that's very good. All right, so I wanted to ask some quick questions because I kind of uh, I should have started with this, but I didn't. So um, Abby, we'll sort of wrap up our discussion about uh, just your interest in reading and how you uh, you like when when did you start to um, to to want? I mean. I, I'm guessing that you started reading as a child and that you, uh, uh, I, I guess my question is what I really want to ask. What made you uh, fall in love with books and literature? Like when when did that sort of light bulb come, the light as it were in the, the Nas Rudin story? Um, <laughs> when did that, that light come on for you that you really uh, found that you liked reading? Um, it all started when I was little. I'm actually dyslexic, so learning to read was very difficult and very hard for me. Um, I grew up with a family full of educators, so there's always books around the house, and my mom and my grandma were always reading, and my mom would be on the couch with these 800-page books, and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> 800 pages? I can barely read a sentence out of a picture book. Like, how is how is this possible? And so seeing that example saying, okay, maybe it is possible and to keep on trying. And so when I was little, I had a book, um, it was called When I Will I Be. It's very old. I, I don't, I don't even think I can find it now. Um, and so I would read it and I'd read a sentence and if I got it wrong, I'd start back on the beginning and over and over and over and over again, um, until I could read. Uh, and then going into school, um, because of my dyslexia and because I had IEPs and, and a learning disability, um, and kids aren't nice all the time, um, I wanted to uh, defy that. I wanted to prove people I wasn't wrong. I'm a very competitive person. And so in one of my classes, there was a reading competition. And you get a sticker for every book you read. And whoever read the most books at the end of the year got like a prize or, or kudos or something. And so I was like, I'm going to do that. And the I ended up becoming in competition with a girl who was not one of the nicest girls. Um, so that fueled me even more. <laughs> uh, so I kept on reading and reading and trying. And even though in the end, like she was probably reading above grade level and reading all these different kind of books. And I was reading at grade level, maybe a little even bit below. It helped me because it forced, it kind of forced me to read different genres and different things. And as that happened, my love for reading grew because I found out, hey, I just don't love the competition of it. I actually love what I'm doing in the moment uh, in, in reading and in those books. Um, so that's how I started reading a lot in high school. And then I went into college and I 
partly studied law. So I was reading a lot of law books. Oh, geez. <laughs> Lost the love of reading because you have to read a lot. Those books and, are huge too, um, right? <laughs> Yeah, they're they're bricks. I I still have them in case I need to like use them as like a doorstop or like a stepping stool or something. Sure, yeah. Um, and so I, yeah, so I lost my my love of reading, and it was actually around the the time where I started watching Supergirl again and all those different kind of shows, and I was done with it, and then I was just watching random stuff. And I'm like, I don't really like what I'm watching. Like, I'm just bored. And so things kind of clicked, like making the Katie book list and everything. And I'm like, well, why don't I start reading more again? See if I can find that love. Um, and then, so then it just kind of like, it, it kind of escalated. Um, so that's my whole journey into books and reading. That's an that's awesome, awesome story. Yeah. Well, uh, look, 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 look who's, who, who's got a big, uh, book list now who's reading all these awesome books. Uh, so, uh, we, we don't even remember that other girl now, uh, who, 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 who knows where she is right now, but you are doing awesome stuff. And, uh, I think that's really, really cool. And, uh, so thank you for starting the, the Katie McGrath book club and, so cool. uh, for for all that you do. And so how can people, um, oh, like if so I have one, one last question and yes. it's because <laughs> I also love reading. Um, although I don't do it and I don't have enough time for it. I tell myself anyway, but I'm always <laughs> looking to read great things. So what are some book recommendations that you have? Because I'm always, anybody who's like, I'm a huge reader. I'm like, what are your favorite books? Tell me them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, book re recommendations. Um, I'm gonna pull up my Goodreads just so I can like uh, kind of go That's more how off I remember of that. what I've read. Um, but <laughs> on the Katie, yes, on um, the book, the Katie book list is Pillars of the Earth, World Without End by Ken Follett. Um, those are definitely my my top books, and I liked them, loved them before I even knew Katie had read them previously. Um, then there's the Name of the Wind, The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss, if that's how you pronounce it. Um, but if yeah, you want to read that series, wait until he publishes the third one, whenever that will be. <laughs> at some point, um, at some point, Abby, can 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 we, you and I, just privately discuss the Name of the Wind books? Because I really like the first one, and I really mm -hmm. like just super dislike the second one. So I don't know if you've read the second one in the book in the book series. I but have. Oh God, it's endless. <laughs> yeah, in part, I feel like most of it is kind of pointless. I'm like, okay, where Thank are we you. going? Where yes. are we going? There's supposed to be a third book, but how is it supposed to all fit? <laughs> it's not going to fit in a third book. It's um, definitely going to be a fourth or fifth book. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's lying to us. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. um, and then off, off of the Katie list, one of my favorite books is The Tea Rose by Jennifer Donnelly. Um, it's a great historical fiction, uh, strong female lead. Um, if I were to ever give Katie a book, it would be that one. Um, it's And it's part of a trilogy, um, but there's new characters introduced. It's still in the same universe, um, but I highly recommend that. Um, a Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Towels. Um, I think it will become a classic. Uh, my friend who I run the book club with, uh, she recommended it to me and it's definitely in my, my top 10, top five. Um, another uh, trilogy I just read was um, the uh, Devabad trilogy. It's The City of Brass and it's by uh, S.A. Chakrabadi. Uh, it has representation, female lead, great story. Um, complete has the full giant picture start to finish so you're not you don't have any of these open ended questions and then she even during quarantine uh came out with a, i think it was about it was i think at least 100 pages or so of behind the scenes stuff stuff that got edited out um that and not that wasn't in the final book or different scenes and parts of different characters and she just did that for free for oh, people cool. so uh, i highly recommend that um, the last book I would re recommend, uh, is A Darker Shade of Magic by W.E. Schwab. Um, that's a trilogy and I believe there's other different parts 
in the universe now. I'm not really caught up in that. <laughs> um, but that's those are uh, definitely my top favorite books. Nice. Okay. So I was I was on Goodreads like favoriting <laughs> everything <laughs> as you spoke. I was like, hold on, what was that? <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if you've read any of the Brandon Sanderson books. Mm -mm. He's. Uh, I but mean, it's on my when list. I say, when I say any of them, I'm be he. Uh, I'm. I have a personal theory that he neither eats nor sleeps. He just writes like all the time because he seems to have a book out like every week. But the um, his Mistborn trilogy is, I think, like a good starting point into his mm -hmm. insane catalog of <laughs> books, and they're some of my favorite books. Well, okay. that is a that is a great list, and uh, I uh, guess we should sort of uh, wrap up because uh, I know on the website, Abby, there's a forum. So, uh, so how do people participate in that? Do they read the book and then go discuss it inside um, the forum? How does the forum's kind of dead? <laughs> oh, okay, no. okay, okay. We started okay. the forum, and then it. We started it and then it just never really took off. Um, okay. If you want to participate in the book club, it's more of a like a personal interaction. Like you send out a tweet and we'll share the tweet and it will be okay. those one-on-one -on -one, uh, connections rather than a giant forum. Um, maybe in the future we will figure figure that out um, or if there's, there's a way to do that. Um, so unfortunately at the forum is well, like Jeremiah's. Did not happen. <laughs> <laughs> no. oh, well, let's see. Oh, but who Eve, knows? What he, have you he done? Die on screen. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm gonna blame it on Eve. I think Eve killed your form. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, I think that's still great though that you have um, uh, personal in interactions and engagement with people. So if you do read any of the books uh, at the Katie McGrath Book Club uh, list, uh, definitely hit Abby up and uh, and mm -hmm. the folks with the book club and share your thoughts. And uh, uh, I thought it was cool. Yvonne said this this feels like a real book club. Uh, so uh, yeah, that was sort of the intention. So uh, I'm glad that's how it felt. Uh, and, and, and watching it. Um, uh, so uh, new Rachel says, does Abby have thoughts on Lena's wardrobe? So I guess I mean, question. <laughs> like, am I wearing the sweatshirt? Right, so. <laughs> I have uh, that one too. Uh, so, <laughs> so, the red bubble. <laughs> so should we get into it? Should we do, I mean, uh, Abby, do you have any boardroom or ballroom thoughts? Cause uh, we, we can get into it. If, uh, if you want to, you can share some of your, your favorite uh, outfits of hers or any uh, thoughts about mm -hmm. her wardrobe. I'm going to play a little intro and then we're going to, we're going to get into it. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll be right back. And now Lena Luther boardroom or ballroom. All right, Abby. So, uh, ha have you uh, have you ever seen an outfit uh, that Lena has worn that you were like, "That's a that's a that's a great uh, outfit or a wardrobe choice"? Is there a favorite one of yours uh, from from over the seasons? I think the the number one wardrobe for me is the suit we saw in the first Lex episode because it was like, "Oh my goodness, this is a completely different outfit that we've seen Lena wear." The, and the purple then that kind of the purple suit, yeah. Um, and so that kind of because it changed from the clavicles and the sweaters and the and it, so it kind of slowly morphed. Um, and so going in to season six, I would like to see more evolution of that because this season we got the florals and the lace. Um, so it's interesting to see what will happen. That's a really solid choice. That purple suit. That's that's one, one of my one. faves. That's that's one of the classics. Um, <laughs> it is. It really is. Yeah. I mean, also, I mean, we love the gray sweater here. I don't know if you have any thoughts about the gray <laughs> <Really> sweater, <do. laughs> uh, but <laughs> but the uh, the purple suit is a great choice. Uh, so thank you for sharing your thoughts. And I, I'm gonna take us out of boardroom or ballroom. So we'll be right back. And this has been Lena Luther, boardroom or ballroom. All right. Well, I think we are going to wrap it up here for the discussion in our book club, but we do have some listener feedback that we need to get to. So if you want to hang out uh, for this, this is going to be Supergirl uh, TV series related. So we have an email from new Rachel who writes, quote, I'm not sure when you're doing a season uh, six pitch meeting episode. We <laughs> probably won't. 
Uh, but uh, the, the year is still young. Uh, but uh, new Rachel shares some ideas. Uh, number one, if we have to bring the DEO back in some way, I see no reason as to why we can't have Lex hire director Bones as Bernie's yeah. replacement <laughs> and have him lead the DEO as a more and antagonistic organization opposing the super friends of course director bones would usurp lex early on and take full control leading to a bit more variety than the lex centric stories we've gotten lately uh new rachel from your typing to the writer's eyeballs <laughs> <laughs> oh my god uh, that would be um fantastic on so many different levels but i love the idea of lex luther who's like i am the smartest man ever i have outwitted anyone and director bones is like hold my skeleton <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how much uh, deo we're gonna get uh but that would be fantastic uh so new rachel also sends in a pitch uh uh not a villain but bring uh kenny lee back uh from uh the midvale episode uh she says it's post-crisis i think we can figure out a way to have the midvale story stay intact without killing him which is a good point oh. uh did the midvale episode uh -huh. still uh -huh. happen on this new earth oh man oh, the, the, the post amadei of post crisis world <laughs> is uh a mystery uh new rachel says have kenny lee kidnapped or disappeared for a while but he doesn't have to be dead and i think seeing a grown-up version of him as an astronomer uh astronomer or some sort of job of that nature would make sense it would be neat to see what he would be like if he hadn't died as well as how Kara and Alex would react, uh, react to his arrival. If Kara had to be with a character created for the show, assuming William isn't Comet, <laughs> and Kara isn't allowed to just be with Brainy in the end, uh, Kenny Lee is my choice. I think that's a really uh -huh. interesting idea because we are uh, kind of in this new universe now, and I think anything is, is possible in the multiverse, so we could see Kenny Lee come back. That would be cool. Uh, and new Rachel's uh, third uh, pitch for season six. Uh, she talks about Brainiac four. Uh, she says, I think, especially after what happened at the end of last season uh, in season five, uh, as well as for what we know about her, this would make a great, uh, this would make an interesting time for her arrival. I could easily see her being a great villain for the super friends, as well as one Kara would personally be invested in defeating. Uh, she could even team up with director bones. I love a uh, new Rachel. I love where this is going. If that was what she saw as necessary or if it fit the story quote um yeah so uh morgan would you want to see more about brainy's uh backstory and his family and his uh ancestry oh yeah definitely i think one of the the, the things that we always kind of and we're broken records at this point but like <laughs> just like knowing more about this wider world that supergirl lives in that there are all these other universes that they can play in um you know when we talk about like nia's you know nia's world but also brainy's like there's a, a really cool untapped potential that we we don't know that much about, and that would be really cool storytelling potential. So yeah, I would love that. That'd be really cool. I think we all want more Supergirl centric stories, but you could tie Brainiac Four to oh, yeah. Supergirl. I think that would be an easy thing to do. Uh, and uh, uh, Paula has a question. I think is sort of relevant here since we've been talking about the DEO and Director Bones. Uh, uh, asking, uh, my biggest question during the hiatus is what happened to all the aliens captured inside cells of the DEO when Ramakan took it down? Did they die? Did they escape? Yeah. Oh, are there, no. <laughs> are, there, are the writers going to address it? I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Know. Uh, cause there wasn't, uh, I guess time, uh, given, uh, what they were having to face at the end of season five with the, uh, worldwide pandemic everyone has been facing. Uh, I don't know if they quite got, uh, a way to address that yet. So hopefully in season six, we'll get more information. It is a good question, though. It is a very good question. <laughs> it is a really good question because they captured over five seasons of Supergirl. They, they had quite a, quite, a, quite a bit of people in there. They they had a lot of folks uh, in that. What, and if, I what if next season is just all the people who've escaped from the DEO <gasps> holding facilities? So it's just a rerun of like all the previous seasons. <laughs> If if that means we get to see Psy again, I'm I know. I'm on board. Um, Listen, because, there's upsides <laughs> because I think Psy was in there. I think they still had her in DEO custody. Uh, so if Psy is dead, I'm gonna be very upset. Oh uh, no! So Psy too. Oh my gosh! Let's not kill off all the Supergirl villains. <laughs> Thank you very much. And all I'm the still, really, I'm still upset about Livewire. <laughs> So I'm still better. Still better. She's she's out there somewhere. I know she is. But I mean, <laughs> crisis. You never know. Hey, hey, maybe she's back. So maybe Sai was at a prison outside the D. I, I, oh, okay. I could have, I could have sworn that Sai was in DEO custody, but maybe she wasn't. So maybe she, maybe she made it out. Maybe, maybe she's a, uh, she's not there and she survives. Uh, 
uh, the Ramakan of it all. Uh, so hopefully that is the case and hopefully I am wrong. I would gl <laughs> gladly be wrong about that. Uh, so uh, Morgan, uh, should yes. we get to the email from so, uh, um, Lila or Lila? Uh, I th yeah. So we got an email from uh, Layla or Lila. I'm so sorry. Um, this is a Karima Barana all over again. Uh, <laughs> Carmina. Oh my God. <laughs> Why? Why can't I? Okay. That's, that's, that's my cross to bear. Um, <laughs> she writes, uh, as a recent listener to Supergirl Radio, I've taken some time during this hiatus to listen to older episodes, including your one on Kara's refugee status. Possibly something for a hiatus episode with the Supergirl Radio legal consultants, all capitalized. I love it. Uh, but assuming that Kara went through the legal system, which given the show, I'm assuming she did not. If Kara is an illegal alien and was trying to gain legal permission to reside in the U.S., if that was rejected, where would they deport her to? Excluding knowledge of Argo City's existence, of course. Although I'd argue that Argo City does not count as where Kara was born, given its intergalactic move through the cosmos. It no longer exists as part of the planet Krypton, and as far as we know, the government doesn't class it as Krypton. Uh, anyway, for sake of clarification, prior to the knowledge that Argo City survived, if Kara was to, say, be arrested by ICE, where could they deport her to? So uh, that's a, a very interesting, um, a very interesting question. And, and we have an answer to it from Leslie, one of our Supergirl Radio uh, legal consultants. Uh, Morgan, I, I know you're going to hate me for this, but will you read? Sure, here uh, I go. <laughs> All right, Leslie, thank you for making this super long. No, uh, <laughs> amazing. I, I love that we have legal consultants that we can just have, we have on retainer. Um, so, so Leslie says, in the quest for peace, which was season four, episode 22, wait, at 36 minutes, 32 seconds, Leslie, you are thorough. Uh, Colonel Haley, the then interim secretary of alien affairs, stated that the vice, that vice president Placino reinstated the Alien Amnesty Act until such time as a full vote can be held in Congress. I took the statement to mean that now President Plastino, having taken over for President Baker, reinstated the Alien Amnesty Act via a presidential executive order until Congress could vote on legislation formally enacting the Alien Amnesty Act as a law as opposed to a mere executive order, which could be revoked at any time. With the reinstatement of the Alien Amnesty Act, Kara zor as an extraterrestrial alien, can lawfully remain and be present in the U.S. Kara zor has the full rights of a U.S. citizen. Again, she might have to re-register, however. Uh, Kara, in the TV show's intro, which we haven't seen since season four, episode 13, What's So Funny About Truth, Justice, and the American Way, still references herself as a refugee, despite having full U.S. citizenship rights under the Alien Amnesty Act. I guess Kara referenced herself as a refugee rather than as a mere visitor because she had no cho uh, choice but to land on Earth since she thought her planet was 100% destroyed and that she had no home planet to return to. Kara took refuge on Earth uh, and is a refugee on Earth in the sense that she came to Earth for shelter and protection after Krypton was destroyed. Given that Argo exists, however, Kara should probably stop calling herself a refugee because she can go home to Argo. Plus, at the end of season three, Kara declared the Earth that Earth was her home. Regarding deportation, ICE returns deporte, uh, deportees to their country of origin. If a deportation order were issued against Kara as Supergirl, who had no rights under the Alien Amnesty Act, the DEO, as the law enforcement agency, which was in charge of capturing aliens, would have to catch her first while in the U.S., restrain her, and transport her to the planet of origin, Krypton. Krypton, however, does not exist in its original form. The government is aware of Argo since President Olivia Marsden knew Superman was off-world on Argo in American Alien, Season 4, Episode 1. The DEO knows of the existence of Argo as well. Uh, even without the existence of Argo, perhaps Carr would be deportable to her solar system of origin, which still exists with Daxum, Ramakan's planet, and other planets. But the U.S. has no ability to transport Carr either back to Argo 5, uh, uh, five light years away or to the Krypton solar system, which is 2000 light years away from Earth. It was absurd for Secretary Lockwood to claim that he was going to send aliens back from where they came from since he has no ability to transport aliens to their planet of origin. Lillian Luther, 
who is much smarter than Lockwood could ever hope to be, at least had the idea of kidnapping the aliens and putting them on a um, Hosin frigate, a light speed spaceship in Exodus season one, episode 15. The aliens would have been transported off Earth uh, to, I don't even know. Uh, Tacron good Goltos. old Tacron Goltos, where the, <laughs> where the aliens <laughs> could arrange passage to their home planets from there. With the reinstatement of the Alien Amnesty Act, Carzarel does not have to worry about deportation. She has the full rights of an American citizen again. Oh my God, Leslie, I love you. That was amazing. That was so, so thorough. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, so I guess uh, if you boil it down, uh, cars car has a uh, full citizenship again. Exactly. <laughs> so no need to no need to worry about that because the good old Alien Amnesty <laughs> Act covers it. It's it's fine. Um, so thank you to Leslie and you, Rachel, for writing in. And uh, well, Leslie wrote in as a response <laughs> to what uh, Leela or Layla wrote in as a question. So thank you all for doing that. Um, so I think that's going to wrap it up for uh, this book club discussion slash uh, boardroom or ballroom slash listener feedback. <laughs> uh, so, Abby, uh, if uh, our listeners and viewers are not familiar with the Katie McGraw B book club, uh, where can they find you guys? Um, the first place you can find us is on Instagram. It's uh, at Katie McGraw uh, book club. Um, and then with McGraw, it's uh M C G R A T H. You don't hear the A T H, <laughs> just so you guys know. Um, and then on our Twitter, it's the letters K T underscore M C G underscore book club. Um, and if you want to follow us, I hope you all do. If you already don't, um, we try to follow everyone who follows us. We want to have a sense of community. Uh, we want to welcome everyone, regardless if you watch the show, if you read books, or how many books you've read, or if you listen to audiobooks, um, that sense of community is important to us, especially during these hard times where you can go on online and social media, and it's also negative. We want to be that positive source. Um, whether you like the books or not, uh, please share your opinions. I'm always open to hearing new ideas and thoughts. Um, I always tell myself, you shouldn't be the smartest person in the room because then you're not learning. Um, so I want to learn. I want. So if you have positive, negative thoughts, let me know. Um, I would love to hear it. That is awesome. Well, uh, thank you for creating the community of people who do like to read and who do want to read these books, because I, I think what you do is really special and unique, and uh, you're doing a great job with it. And uh, thank you for spending some time with us uh, to discuss uh, going on being with us and for sending us uh, some uh, Katie McGrath book club uh, bookmarks here. So we'll have to oh, next, cool. <laughs> next, next time we do a, a giveaway or a contest. If new Rachel, I swear we're going to do the plugs. I know we're going <laughs> to, we're going to do them. So if we have a winner for the plugs contest, uh, we'll send you a, a, a Katie McGrath book club bookmark. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to get these to some viewers because they're pretty awesome. Very handy uh, when I was reading going on B because uh, I, I don't have a lot of book uh, marks. You can tell I read a lot. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so that was very helpful. So thank you for what you do with the book club. And uh, thank you for creating that sense of community that you do. All right. Well, you can contact uh, Supergirl Radio if you would like uh, by going to our website at supergirlradio.com, which I need to uh, pull that up somewhere. Uh, Morgan, if you want to uh, uh, put those graphics up while I talk, that might be helpful because sure, uh, sure. I'm finding it difficult to do. Uh, Where can things. I find those graphics? <laughs> uh, if you go to banners, uh, oh, ho, ho. click That's on banners. Too easy. Yeah. Okay. All, All right. right. So let's I'm get let's, ready. Let's mm -hmm. make this super profesh. So I'm yeah. going to read and you're going to do the graphics and we're going to make this look a seamless. All right. So you can trust me. <laughs> so, so if you want to post a comment on our website, you can go to supergirlradio.com. If you want to email us, you can go to supergirlradio at gmail.com and write us an email that way. If you'd like to leave us a voicemail, you can call us at 678-718-7252 and make sure to write or call in before Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. And you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram, all at Supergirl radio uh you can listen to us on google play iheart radio spotify where we have a spotify playlist that includes music featured on and inspired by the show uh we're also on radio public and pod chaser 
We are listed on DC's fan page, which you can find at dccomics.com slash dc-fans. We are available on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher Radio. So if you have some time, we encourage you to give us a rating and write us a review over there. And if that seems like a lot of information, and it totally is, uh, you can just go to supergirlradio.com and find all of those links to everything I just mentioned on the right side of the page. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And, and so I, special, but I, I got through it. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to uh, do the same for you because it is that time. Here we go. Uh, where we need to plug the DC TV podcast. Here we go. <laughs> <clears throat> Did you know that Supergirl Radio is also part of the DC TV podcast network? Did you? Well, guess what other podcasts are part of the network? The Flash, Black Lightning, Legends of Tomorrow, Batwoman, Titans, Doom Patrol, Stargirl, oh my God, Green Lantern, Strange Adventures, the upcoming Superman and Lois series, or DC TV After Dark, uh, one that I host that I continuously forget in this scroll. <laughs> uh, if you like any of them, all of them, don't tell us if you like none of them. Uh, <laughs> you should <laughs> make sure to follow DC TV podcasts on social media and subscribe to the podcast mega feed if you want all of those podcasts in one place. And if you're like, I love the podcast. I'm living that podcast life. I'm listening to them all. I want some way to show that to the world. Well, guess what? We have the solution and it's called our DC TV podcast T public store. So if you need some new t-shirts or mugs or stickers, um, you can go to Supergirl radio and click on the T public store button at the top of the page. Yeah. And um, actually, let me take uh, that banner off so that you can see the merch. Uh, I figured since uh, we were talking about Katie McGrath <laughs> this week, I thought I'd highlight a couple of Lena items that we have in the store. We've got a, 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 a good a good handful of Lena designs. Yeah. Uh, so we've got mugs. We've got T-shirts. <laughs> this one uh, says the Luther name doesn't deserve Lena. Yeah, it's That's an right. a, it's an actual quote from the show. I believe Kara uh, or Supergirl might have uh, said it at the time. She might have been Supergirl, uh, and I think that was she actually said it to the, Mercy. Yeah, she. Oh, yeah, that, that yeah. was. Uh, I think that was in Fallout. Uh, R.I.P. Mercy. Never forget. <laughs> um, uh, just want to, you know, uh, still pour one out for Mercy Graves. Uh, it was too soon. Uh, yeah, so you can uh, go and check out our Lena merch in the DC TV podcast uh, T Public store. And the way you do that is you just go to SupergirlRadio.com, and on the top of the page, it uh, there's a T Public link. You just click on that, and you'll go right to the store. And I believe there there was a sale at uh, some point this week. So I'm not sure exactly when the sale ends. So get on it if you want to get some stuff uh, for a discounted price. I don't want to say for sure, but I think that National City Sweatshirt is available on the Tee Public. I believe it is. So you uh, yeah. you can go check that out. I think the, the shirt I'm wearing is also in oh, there. Oh, yes, it is because I have it. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm sporting the uh, Sarah Louver Comica Girl uh, Sunny Danvers shirt which has my favorite uh, way that uh, Supergirl defeated Mr. McShaz Pitalik, uh, <laughs> drinking a glass of orange juice. It's my favorite thing. Uh, made a big statement about free will just by drinking orange juice. So uh, that is the best. Uh, so yeah, you can have, head over to the T Public, uh, T, uh, the DC TV podcast T Public store by going to supergirlradio.com and clicking at the top of the page. All right. Well, you uh, can find me on Instagram at the Derby Kid, and you can uh, check out my YouTube channel because I'm trying to get new content up there uh, by going to youtubecom duckmilkprod. And I just want to say, just a personal little slight retraction from last week. <laughs> I felt a little bad after my comment about uh, the DC superhero girl, Supergirl, that uh, I refer to as sounding like she smoked a lot. That was maybe a little bit harsh because I went back and rewatched. <laughs> some of those clips and I must have watched a couple of clips clips where in and, and now to be fair to me and my memory, she does have a little bit of lower and raspier voice that I would expect for that design of Supergirl, but it's not as bad as I remembered. I think in my mind I had made it worse than it was. So I just wanted to say my personal apologies to uh, Anna East Fairweather. I was being a little too critical. I may have made it personal, which I'd never try to do. So I, I just wanted to <laughs> clear the air and clear my conscience. Uh, maybe I can't fix it uh, in terms of the uh, the the 
the Buddhist way of doing things. Uh, but I just wanted to clear that out and um, uh, kind of you can't uh, change the past, Rebecca. You can only move forward and let it go. <laughs> so I just I just wanted to say that because I felt like I was being a little too critical and too harsh and I was going against my own personal way of reviewing things because I felt I got a little too personal. So I do think maybe uh, for me and my personal taste, that's not the way I think that uh, voice should have gone with that design. Uh, but I do think she did a, a good job. And I think I, I watched a little bit of her reel and some of her videos. And I think she was probably hired. My guess is that she, she has a really spunky personality. Like she, in some of those other things that she's done, she's really energetic. And so I think she brings that to the character of Supergirl, even if, uh, if, even if it's maybe not what I expected out of the design. So I just wanted to say that I felt bad and I wanted to correct myself uh, for being a little too harsh. So thank you for letting me air air and get that off, uh, get off my mind. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so you can find me on um, Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Mojo Tastic. And you can also find me as a co-host on the Legends of Tomorrow podcast. Um, and we are planning on getting my, um, my friend and fellow co-host of DC TV, uh, Ather Dark, Sarah. We're bringing her on Legends again. She still hasn't watched Legends. We're going to make her drink. Um, we're you, don't, you don't need people. to watch the show. You don't need to watch the show. She does need to drink a lot. And then we're going to do <laughs> another episode uh, of Drunk Legends with Sarah. So we're planning on recording that, I believe, this week. So that should be out sometime soon. So that's exciting. Apparently, this is a fan favorite where we just make uh, our friends uh, get drunk and watch and then be like, what are you in this show. Uh, if you want to hear her sober, you can uh, go over to DC TV After Dark, where we're um, talking to the other uh, hosts of the DC TV podcast family and uh, and chatting about uh, what they're up to, what they think of uh, the DC shows in general, just kind of about life. And it's kind of a, a free flowing conversation. We've had um, Kat and Amy both from the um, Legends of Tomorrow podcast, and we have uh, we have a uh, Rachel coming up from Batwoman podcast, so that should be fun because uh, certainly Batwoman is a show that has a lot to talk about right now. So mm. that'll be a uh, that'll be a good discussion, I think. Yeah, I always wondered about uh, drunk history because uh, I follow uh, Jen Kirkman a little bit, and mm -hmm. she's done a lot of those drunk histories, and she's some of my favorite. Like that's how I discovered Jen Kirkman was. Uh, it was on YouTube. She did a a, a, a drunk history there and uh she's so funny too <laughs> she, well and and she said like it took a lot out of her to do you know to get drunk and do all that stuff and so i wondered like if you do it so many times does it just <laughs> took a real toll on you i don't know well i think sarah sarah specifically asked us if we could have it on a um on a friday because i think the last time we did it to her um it was a thursday and then she had to like get up for work the next day oh, and she was like no. could i please just let me have my hangover in peace on a saturday <laughs> she really she suffers for her craft is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> well that should be uh something uh to look forward to and uh you you can you can listen to that drunk episode without having to watch the show you sure experience can. it with sarah uh, I think that's a good way to do it. So uh, <laughs> have thank you, you never watched Legends, but you just want to jump in randomly. This is your episode to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I personally find it uh, enlightening and entertaining. So thank you, uh, Sarah, for um, uh, really sacrificing yourself uh, for the rest of us. So <laughs> really, really appreciate that. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode of Supergirl Radio. But until next time, I'm still Rebecca Johnson. I'm still Morgan Glennon. And if you love reading, well, go over and uh, join the Katie McGrath Book Club. DC TV Podcast. There's too many now. Exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> Is being, becoming a human burrito a plus or a minus? I don't know. It does seem snug. I mean, they say you are what you eat. Oh, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> so I do a podcast called Supergirl Radio, and one of our segments is Lena Luther boardroom or ballroom. Because really? <laughs> she looks like a boss in this coat. Is Nasty Luther like a different Luther? It's not just Lena being mean. No. <laughs> Ooh. Helen Slater here. It's so fun to know that you're hosting a podcast called Supergirl Radio. Supergirl Radio.